80% of decisions are fundamentally not important. If you get them wrong, you can reverse them. If you believe that, the best way to take decisions is fast. Find the time to focus on those 20%, the 80% just decide on. Management consultancy at Oliver Wyman, from entry level to appointed CEO. He steered this ship through the credit crunch, a capable captain, through rough seas, no matter how strong the wind would blow. The day you finish being head of Oliver Wyman, no one's gonna take your call anymore, so you gotta do it now. So I had a 100% hit rate on all these people who I asked to meet. They all said yes. What was your pitch? The pitch was, one of the things I found interesting about the British Council is I come in as an outsider, but this isn't a place like Oliver Wyman that I grew up in. So I've had to think a lot about what do I have to bring that's different. The founder of Oliver Wyman said something to me which has always stuck in my head, which is... Greetings, I'm Ashley Samuels McKenzie. And I'm Charles Parkinson. And welcome to How I Became. Where we unveil the unscripted journeys of inspirational figures. Hi there, I'm Scott McDonald, and this is how I became CEO of the British Council. If you enjoy the show, could you do one thing? Subscribe. Wherever you are, just click the subscribe or follow button. That simple act can help us grow the podcast in a big way, and we need your support to do it. And if you really want to help play a part in our growth, rate us on Spotify or leave a review on Apple Podcasts. It would mean the world. Thank you. With a life that starts in Toronto, street hockey, church and fishing, he spent some time in Saudi Arabia. What a stark contrast to the life that he was living. Leaving uni and stepping into journalism led to some dead ends and a lesson in being humbled. And after what seemed like hundreds of rejections, he found a new vine to swing from in his career path jungle. Management consultancy at Oliver Wyman, from entry level to appointed CEO. He steered this ship through the credit crunch, a capable captain, through rough seas, no matter how strong the wind would blow. In his life, he's had many ups, a few downs. Who knows if he'll have enough time to announce them all. Welcoming Scott McDonald, Chief Executive Officer of the British Council. Thank you. And um, if nothing else happens on this podcast today, the fact that there has been a poem written about me is some sort of pinnacle in my life. Oh, amazing. <laughs> well, you've got another one to come at the end as well. There you go. <laughs> so I think your story is going to be fascinating. For We're going to delve into a lot about business today. We're going to delve into a lot about how billion dollar businesses, which are two of which you've been CEO of in your career, how they're run, how they're operated, how they function, how to, to, to run a business at its best um, and how to, to be a leader and how to manage leaders. Um, so that is some of the great value there is in this, in this story. I'm looking forward to getting there. But this is the story we're going to tell first of, of a young man born in Canada mm -hmm. who goes through this, this journey without, with high ambitions at the start but does face a lot of rejection at the beginning. And then eventually you do um, become CEO of one of the biggest management consultancy firms in the world, Oliver Wyman, and then now later, uh, now CEO of the British Council. So before we get into the story of a young Scott McDonald, let's give some context. That's what I want to start with. For anybody who might not know much about consulting or management consulting, how would you describe... Oliver Wyman's position in the management consulting world. So Oliver Wyman's a pretty young firm as far as management consultants go. It was formed mid '80s, um, and at that time, the you know, the top three management consultants were the same as they are now, mm. um, and all quite big and powerful at the time. So, so we had to think about how do you start a management consulting firm and do something completely different than everyone else to get noticed so that you get any business at all. And what we chose at the time was specialization. Mm -hmm. And you know, our big three competitors at the time all focused on a sort of a generalist management consulting view. Like we can teach you how to do management, how to think, how to structure things. And we said, well, you need to combine that with a deep industry specialization to actually be more useful. And, and you know, we didn't have the capacity to take on many industries, so we took on one at the time, which was financial services. 
And that was basically our pitch to the world. We said, you know, we have what some of what the others have, but we're deeply specialized in financial services. And because of that, we'll be a bit more nerdy, we'll be a bit more analytical, we'll focus more on the numbers because we deeply understand the, you know, the micro and macro economics of that business. And that that was basically the pitch of Oliver Wyman in the early years. And I, you know, it's been a long time since 1985. That's when the company began. <laughs> That's when it began. And yeah. so, you know, all of those firms, including Oliver Wyman, have evolved enormously and, and changed over time. And Oliver Wyman now still covers financial services, but also all the other sectors. It's developed more of a generalist capability as well, but it still is largely based on you know, specialized coverage of, of sectors. Mm. And again, just to give you context of the scale of businesses you've run, this is a company that in 2022, 2023, had revenues, reported revenues of $3.1 billion. This is not a small company. It had 50 offices globally, maybe 60, um, 5,000, 6,000 staff globally. And these this, these were all under your remit. Yeah, that, that all sounds right. I mean, when I left Oliver Wyman, which was in 2021, um, that was roughly the shape of Oliver Wyman, what you're mm -hmm. describing. I, I also sat at that time, you know, Oliver Wyman was owned then by uh, an even bigger company called Marsh McLennan. And I sat on the executive team of Marsh McLennan, which, which had closer to 100,000 people around the world and, and offices in 100 places. So I had a little bit of the flavor of what it felt like to run something much bigger too. But, you know, Oliver Wyman was, is, was big enough. Mm. Yeah, you were on the executive, executive committee Correct. Of, of Marsh, Marsh McLennan. Yes. yes. And there, for any, again, context, this is a, a has a turnover of $22.7 billion in 2023. So these are large organizations, and we're really going to delve into, um, yeah, your perspectives on, on how to run great businesses at, at a large scale. Uh, and then, again, finally, before we get into the story, British Council, can you explain what the British Council is? <laughs> to someone who's 10 years old. So the British Council builds trust between people in the UK and in the rest of the world. And the purpose of that trust is to facilitate trade, visits, knowing each other, um, working together, better alliances, so ultimately more peace and prosperity mm. for both the UK and everywhere else in the world. Now, later on, I'll get into how we do that and why we do that. But that's that's the purpose. You know, we, it was formed nearly a century ago. This year, this year is our 90th um, birthday. Happy birthday. Yeah. Happy birthday. <laughs> Thank you. And with a, you know, incredible foresight, I think, by the people who formed it at the time, recognizing that the best way to build trust is often not through government relationships. It's got to be in more of a an independent organization that can take a long-term view that cuts through political cycles. Mm. I see. And there's three areas you focus on, arts and culture, education, and English. That's right. Great. Mm. We will get into it. Um, and and sorry, just lastly, in terms of this, um, the numbers associated to the British Council, what what is it bringing in per annum? So, so the British Council has it's a different beast than Oliver Wyman or Marsh McLennan, and so we actually have to fund the British Council. Um, so it's a charity officially, is that it, correct? It is. The, I think it's mm. the UK's biggest charity. Wow, we well. seem to pop, uh, pop up and down between one and two occasionally, but Who's the two? biggest charity, it, it's different in different years. Okay. Mm. Um, but the, um, so we get funding from the government. We get funding from other governments, other partners, and we have two big income generating parts of the British Council, our teaching English and our exams business. So there's about a billion pounds in total funding. Every year. Every year. Yeah. And we have about 10,000 people, and we, have, we operate in 200 countries with a physical presence in 100. And there's how many countries in this world? There's it can't be many more than 200. Wow. <laughs> That's interesting. Are you in? Are you in? Is Borneo a country, or is that just part of Malaysia? I'm trying to think of somewhere really obscure. So we're we're almost everywhere you would imagine. If you were to list off to me like the troubled places in the world today, so 
Yemen are we there? Yes. The occupied tal- uh, territories in Palestine were there. Myanmar were North there. North Korea? Ukraine were there. We are not in North Korea. Okay. No. There, found there are a few countries in the world. North Korea would be one. Iran would be one mm-hmm. um, where you know, the, the, the values are so different um, that it's very difficult for us to operate, but, but very few. Mm-hmm. Fascinating. Okay. That's the little story of Oliver Wyman and the British Council. Now to the man who became CEO of both of these organizations. How on earth do you get into that position? How do you become CEO of one of the biggest management consultancy firms in the world, the biggest charity in in the UK, one or two maybe? Um, That's the story. So let's go back. All the way back to Toronto, Canada. How does life begin? Set the scene for us. So I think the best way to describe the early me, if you've watched any sort of early Mike Myers movies or or movies like that about Canada, imagine you're a Canadian suburb outside Toronto growing up with a pretty normal life, I would say. Mm -hmm. So nice, happy family. I'd walk to school every day in the neighborhood. I would play street hockey in the evenings. Um, I would try and avoid church every Sunday, where, but the, the, the family liked to like to go. Um, and we had, you know, we'd go up to the lakes north of Toronto and swim and water ski and, and fish on the weekends. And basically, you know, me and all my friends did the same thing. And that was was essentially going to be my my path in life. So that's where I started. A little bit into so your early teens, perhaps. Your father made a decision. Yeah, so so my dad was a doctor, um, and you, you kind of have to think about how crazy he was at the time, because we, ha- we had four kids in the family. Um, I was the oldest, I was 11, and he came home one evening and announced that he was going to move us all to Saudi Arabia. Um, a little but, bit different to Canada. Yeah, it's a little bit different. I, I can't remember now if I had ever heard of Saudi Arabia. It's hard to <laughs> get my mind back to that. But that's how foreign it was, even if I had heard of it. And we went, we went off to Nashville for a couple months to have an orientation and learn a little bit about what our lives would be like. Then we ended up in Riyadh, where they were opening a new hospital, which is why he went over there to help open the new hospital and build up a, a department of it. What is that hospital there today? What is it's that? still there. It's called the King Faisal Specialist Hospital. I still think it's probably the, the best hospital in, in the Middle East. Wow. Oh, wow. Um, and it's been there for a long time. It, it's always been, you know, so at least it was at the time, you know, really cutting edge because they invested a ton of money in it and they tried mm-hmm. to create a, a, a super hospital there. Um, what was your dad's role then if he was building so he my dad was an obstetrician and gynecologist and he was building so he had to build that department it was really with it was an interesting mandate it was sort of build it attract all the best people in the world to work there and ultimately leave it run by saudis preferably you know given the culture uh, saudi women and yeah. so you know you have a certain window to do that, and then it should be all run locally, um, I- ideally by women. And that you know that was accomplished over over many years as oh. well. But you know we so we arrived there this sort of gaggle of little kids with with very little experience in the world in the middle of Riyadh, and it was it was like a great adventure for us because we traveled all over the place because um, because it's it's so um, close to places. So we were often. India and Nepal and and Malaysia and Singapore and all these spots on a regular basis and then just growing up sort of beside the desert um, I I remember getting a motorbike to drive through the desert and and we do how old were you when you got the motorbike probably about 12 yeah amazing Uh, and then we would we'd go camping in the desert on a a regular basis we'd go over to the Red Sea north of Jeddah and and, um, go diving off the sea there and at this time there's the whole place was largely deserted oh wow and if you you know a lot has changed since then but Saudi Arabia was actually a very open country in the late 70s as well in what regard just you know very open to foreigners and very easy to travel around in and, and easy to do things. You know, since then, they've been through a variety of cycles. Mm-hmm. Um, but at, at that time, it was sort of a wonderfully welcoming place. So um, you go through this experience of in the, in the Middle East and various different countries. 
you eventually study at university back in Canada and you get a great degree and you enter into the world of work and you find your first career? Yeah, so I, I finished university. I went, I had a girlfriend at the time and I went traveling and we ended up traveling for a long time on remarkably little money from what I can remember. We were away for about 14 months and I got back and I, you know, I had, I had in my mind that what the way I would start is to become a journalist. So mm -hmm. I was slightly interested in politics, slightly interested in journalism. So I joined a kind of political magazine. It was called The Idler in Toronto. Nothing to do with The Idler um, that exists, exists in the UK, but interesting place. We had our offices above a pub. Um, once or twice a week in the pub, we used to have famous people in, ranging from the prime minister to, to famous writers, and we'd have these intellectual debates over, over lots of drinks, and it was a wonderful experience. I liked it. Um, I, it. It didn't fit particularly well with my skills. I, I'm, not, I'm not a naturally gifted writer. Um, I, I didn't have a long sort of pedigree in politics. So I found sort of niches, good ways to help out, and, and I was enjoying it. I quite liked the life. Um, but like most magazines, and I don't think things have changed in the last 30 or 40 years, you know, we barely made enough money to survive. And at the end of each month, we sat down at the table with the eight or ten of us that worked there and sort of divvied up the money we had for everyone. And, and you know, the amount I typically got was about $100 or $200, which was not enough to live. So... I did that you know, after after six or nine months. I thought, well, I've got to do something else. Mm -hmm. um, this doesn't work. So let me look at you know, what I did in university was economics and finance. Let me go into that world and sort of put myself on a more stable financial basis. And just cover, which university did you go to? I went to McGill in Montreal. Okay. And th what's the reputation of this university? So v very good in Canada. I think very good internationally as well. So, you know, I felt like I was coming out of there with good qualifications, good marks, and everything was, was set up well. So you must have gone into this world of, of okay, and leave journalism behind. Your, your next target is investment banking, is that correct? You must have felt like, well, I've got a great degree. Um, I'm very qualified. I'm a great person. It must have been quite easy to get a role. Yeah, so you would think so. Um, and, I, you know, looking back on... That age after after you've gone to university, I think most, you know, if things are going well, you really have a view that you're about to conquer the world. You're just trying to figure out which way you're going to conquer the world. And life is good then as well. Yeah. So I'd, I decided to get out of this journalism degree. I took this or journalism uh, job. I, I, I had this fantastic degree, I thought. Um, and like everyone at that age, too, I thought I was rather charming. So I thought I'd do well in interview. And I, so I went out and started applying for jobs. And I hadn't even really specified investment banking. I was looking quite broadly. It could be banking. It could be investment banking. It could have been asset management. It could have been private equity. You know, that whole suite of, of, of things. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I started firing out applications. And, and I found... Like a, I had a wave of rejections. I must have had fifty rejections with with no interviews. Wow, um, that's painful. with with a yeah. real sort of wake up call to me because I don't think there was any fundamental problem with the the resume or things like that. But it was just a you know an immediate reminder that there are a ton of good people out there looking for jobs, mm -hmm. working really hard to find them, um, and it's just not easy even in a time like that. So I had. You know, a couple rounds of that, I started to get some interviews. Um, I didn't get those jobs either. And I even sort of felt, you know, at one point I, I, I looked at jobs that I thought were, you know, not at the level I wanted. So independent financial advisors, almost people who'd traveled the country trying to sell financial advice. And I remember going to one interview in a place, and they had sort of 300 people interviewing on this one day. Wow. We all had to write a test and then do something. And again, I didn't get I didn't get the job offer. Oh, so and that's I, even more painful. <laughs> you don't even want the job. I don't only said you. But I think that was the key, <laughs> right? To, to the like reflecting back on that period at the end, I think I sort of. I, I at least gave off a feeling of entitlement and and you know, the fact that I thought I should 
deserve these jobs. I thought I would get them a I bit see. of arrogance. They could they could tell this in the interview. I think so. And I, yeah. I think if I had been in the hiring spots and that you want someone with grit who who, you know, is mm-hmm. gonna have to work their way into this and is gonna work really hard. You don't want someone who feels like they're entitled to the job. So, you know, that period did end. I got a really good job at the end of it. But it stuck with me for a long time, just it, you know how painful it was not to find something. A bit of readjustment of, of my own brain then to, to say, you know, you know, get your expectations right, tone down any arrogance you have in there, and, and move on. Mm. So you recover from these things, but they're good lessons. So it's almost a, maybe a key ingredient to the path to becoming a CEO is get humble. You know, if you don't have that humble slap, let's call it, uh, at some stage, you may be face that, that issue later in your career, which may hold you back um, of this sort of arrogance and entitlement. I think that's right. I, I've certainly met, you know, I've met hundreds of CEOs in my life. And I would say the myth of the arrogant CEO it's not entirely wrong. There are certainly arrogant CEOs out there and, and maybe not a small number. The fa- By far the majority of the good ones I have worked with are fairly humble people. Mm. Mm. I love that. And it's a great, that's a really help, healthy, good thing. That's what we want in this world is, is humble leaders. Um, you eventually, someone, you've learned this, you know, this valuable lesson and someone hires you. Who is it and uh, how long are you there for? So the job I eventually got was in an investment bank. It was called Dominion Securities at the time, was which was the predecessor to the institutional businesses at the Royal Bank. At the time, it was an independent investment bank, and it was the best one in Canada. Great reputation. Um, it was in a funny place. It had a reputation for sort of everyone working insanely hard, but really excellent work, and it was good for your resume, good for your career. Um, so I lucked out in the end and got a job there. And I got on an interesting program they had where they moved you around the whole bank um, two months in each unit of the of the investment bank over a two-year period. So a wonderful rounding. Mm-hmm. Um, and then at the end of that time, if, if they kept you on, you got to pick where you went. And I picked um, mergers and acquisitions, so a, you know, a part of, of, of corporate finance. And I, and I love that. You know, it was an interesting thing. There was lots of um, good mental stimulus and challenge. You worked across different sectors on different prob- problems at quite a, a high pace. Although it, it was in the early 90s, which was sort of that heyday of investment banking where you did, you worked seven days a week, you know, 20 hours a day. Really? Wow. And it was 20 co- hours? Yeah. There's only 24. <laughs> Where'd you sleep? It, we didn't sleep much. Did it, you it, sleep it, on, at the it, office ever? I slept at the office quite frequently. Wow. And Where? It was, On the floor? It was, you've probably, you're probably right. I'm exaggerating a little bit. But it was, it was basically working all the time. I see. Um, and I, I, didn't even, I didn't even mind that at the time because it was interesting work, lots of camaraderie in the place. And well, I, I guess if you had 50 rejections, you're like, I'm just happy to have a job right now. Right. Jump yeah, so I'm, I'm happy to have a job. I'm charging ahead. And this job it came with a fair bit of prestige in Canada at that Mm. age or at that level of a job, and that was great. How much were you earning as a starting job back then? Gosh, it's a good question. Now, it was a lot, I think, for for that time and that type of job. I'm guessing it was something like $40,000 or something. $40,000, and you're how old? And I would have been 22, 21, 22. so that was, what would that be, I guess, in today's, if you convert it to today kind of salary? Probably be the same as earning something like sixty, seventy, mm. eighty thousand dollars nice. today. So that's yeah, not good, a bad good start. Good yeah. No. So it was great. I mean, it, good job with, with good pay. Yeah. Um, and and I could actually you know lead a good life, get a nice apartment, and and get on with things. Um, but my my challenges weren't to end there because I then did I did that job in total for four and a half years. I think it was coming in on five years. And I had it was a funny department I was in, really, really talented people. We had a lot of stresses though. There were big personalities and things mm-hmm. going on. Um, and I'd kind of lost my way there. I'd say, you know, I was working because that, that was what I did, and I had a job, and it was a good job, and I didn't want to lose it. 
but I wasn't particularly inspired by the place. Mm. Um, I wasn't making huge moves to to you know get better to position myself for other things. And I think the same thing happened to me again. And yeah, you know, they were looking at me, and they I think they just thought, look, there are there are hungrier people here. Oh, and and you know, despite the fact that you're working all the time. We can see more hunger in others, and Some so are doing twenty-two hours, not twenty. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you know, at one at one point, they did a bit of a restructuring at the bank, and 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 they asked me to leave. Oh, so you so, got fired. So I got fired, and that was it. So I'm five years in to my first job, which was great, and I I, I liked the job. Um, and again, another wake up call for me. I think the same as the one before. So you can tell I'm a bit of a slow learner here, but. <laughs> Um, but you know, takes I needed to take stock again, think about think about why it happened. I think that the reason it happened is because I didn't have my heart in the job, mm. and they could see that. And you know, in in a way, they made the right decision. And many years later, the head of that business got in touch with me, and and he said, you know, I feel really bad about what happened because you know you you were doing well and stuff, but you know, I didn't think you wanted to do this for oh, for a job and and that's why i made the decision he said i hope i i hope you have no hard feelings because you know we liked you we liked what you did what role were you in when he called you i was i think i was even running oliver wyman uh, oh, well, I bet and, and, I, and I did to <laughs> but i did say i said no hard feelings and you were you were right yeah i didn't have yeah, my heart yeah, in it you identified right. that it was a yeah. painful way to learn that lesson but then i went on to you know, do things maybe I was more suited for. Yeah, I guess you can thank him. Had yes. he not fired I didn't you? go so far as to thank him, but I, <laughs> <laughs> but I really, I, I, I really didn't have any hard feelings, and he was right. Um, and and that also gave me. You have so much need for luck in life. So what yeah. that what happened to me there is, I had to say. So here I am in Toronto. That not many of my family were in Toronto at the time. I'd just gotten fired from this job, which was slightly humiliating. And I needed, you know, so how do I get away and do something to remove that humiliation and do something really good again? Yeah. And so I decided to go back to university again. And I, that's what that's what brought me over to the UK. And I came over here and did an international relations degree, um, mm. which was, you know, again, really interesting, good way to spend my time, change the course of my life. I never expected to still be here in, in the UK all this time later. But you know, if I hadn't done that, I would I wouldn't have found Oliver Wyman, and most of the things that had happened wouldn't have happened. So, so sometimes good things come out of these uh, horrible yeah. experiences. I think it's a really poignant point mm -hmm. because there's a there is a lot of restructuring going on right now. You know, um, a lot of tech companies are having to lay off people, and to to you know, your story shows that it's not the end of everything. That is part of the corporate life for most people at some point you may get you know laid off and that and it's not personal and it could be the thing that leads you on to the next great moment in your career um so a bit of motivation and inspiration for anybody listening who may be be going through that at the moment i think that's right and i like one of the things i really look for in people i hire now is is resilience mm. and these things teach you like I'm not going to claim for a second that I have had a hard life in any way. I've actually had, you know, a remarkably easy life. But even these small little failures you have along the way um, build resilience in, and that's what we're really looking for with people you work with. You want them to be able to bounce back from things and learn and 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 get better. So we get on to the beginning of your Oliver Wyman journey to the top mm. to become not even CEO but Group CEO of. Uh, companies within the group let's um but at this point this, this is not oliver wyman we know today the multi-billion turnover company with six thousand staff 60 offices how many staff are there in 1995 so the company i joined at that point had two offices the headquarters was in new york where i think there were about 30 people at the time and I joined the London office, which had about 19 people. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for, for, for those of the your listeners today who are sort of in small um, tech companies or small startups, that's what we were. We had, a, you know, 
a small floor. It was when I joined, we were just off Salvo Row upstairs. Mm -hmm. But you know, the, the lunchroom had a ping pong table. Um, we didn't have computers for everyone at the time. You know, we shared one computer for the office. There oh, were wow. no mobile phones. And we were, you know, it was really a, we had a handful of clients. The thing was run on a shoestring. We're trying to make it work. Mm. But, it, but it was really fun, interesting, entrepreneurial, had a wonderful leader that one of the founders, Alex Oliver, was, um, you know, really good thinking on what, what makes a company attractive. Um, and it, now everyone talks about this, but the idea of having, having values and having a purpose and, and lots of focus like that was, was it made it an unusual place. Mm -hmm. It's fascinating. So that, yeah, 50 people when you joined, it's now over 5,000. That's 100, 100 X on, on the, on the size of the staff. Yeah, it might even be bigger now. They've, I think they've done, they've grown it even faster after I left. So oh, it's, wow. it's, it's probably up at six or 7,000 now. Wow. wow. Um, but it, you know, that, that was, in fact, if I, if I think back on the Oliver Wyman journey, a huge amount of the fun was the early years, too, as we sort of figured out chaotically how to grow and how to expand internationally and how, how to you know, develop new skills that people would actually pay money for. So what's your, I'm interested in what your journey is then from entry level to CEO, but also in tandem with that, the, the, the journey of the company, like how do you, how was the company grown from this 50 person team to where it is today, where it's competing with Boston Consultancy Group and McKinsey and the like. So share that. that. Yeah, so I'll talk a little bit about the company first, then I'll go back to sort of my path through it. But I mean, I described earlier our, our specialization in Oliver Wyman, how we focused on single sector at the time and really made that pitch. That sort of hit the zeitgeist of, of the time. Oh, right. And so it, were others doing that at this point? No one else was doing it then. They, they all are now. But when we did that, it sort of hit a sweet spot. And we also got lucky because we focused on financial services, and that was sort of 30 years of boom in financial services. So I think our, our sort of hypothesis on what you need was right, and we got some luck as well. Um, and so we... You know, we expanded massively and very fast because what we had to offer was really valuable to the whole financial services mm. sector. And, uh, what, what, when it when it was growing fast, are you are you are they reporting the the numbers and and are you aware of like how quickly the the company is growing revenue revenue wise? Are you, and what was that growth like? How much were they turning over when you joined, and how quickly was that growing? Yeah, so they, I think when I joined, they were probably turning over something like 30 million a year okay and you know it, it would double or triple every year and really and, wow. and 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 go go very quickly it was a private company at the time so they, they didn't have to um publicly disclose anything but internally that was all shared so we knew it was growing and we had um one of the interesting things the guys did at the time was all of our pay was directly linked to the success of the company mm. i mean not not totally untraditional for small companies, but nice. but every year we'd have a bonus announcement. It was the same bonus for everyone in the company in in percentage terms. Right, and you know that could range from in a bad year it could be thirty percent of your salary, in a good year it could be a hundred percent of your wow. salary. And we'd all wait for the announcements on, on the day. It's great. So, um, and uh, numbers wise, what were we talking? How like what would your bonus be back then? I think I also started at Oliver Wyman. So this is five years later. Now now I'm talking in sterling rather than dollars, but I think I started on 35,000 there as well. Okay. Um, and because consulting is not as highly paid as investment banking is. But right. then that, that, that bonus was on top of that and you know that those go up pretty significantly. So you could time. actually get 70 grand if, you, if, you, if, it was, if it's your, if the yeah. bonus doubles. Yeah, if, you, if, you, if we had a good year. And, you know, and that was everyone that, that was not only sort of the frontline consultants, but all the all the back office staff we had to got and the same bonus percentage. Wow, so that yeah. so that was exciting. And that's not 35K in 2024. That's 35K or 70K in 1995. N 1995. Ooh. That's right. So it was Whole good. Money. Um, so that was the basic way we grew. Mm. And then 
sort of fast forwarding a fair bit, in 2003, we sold the company to Marsh McLennan. And the reason we did that is basically we were scaling so fast, we, we needed you know, we needed more financial muscle to grow. We wanted mm-hmm. to expand into many other sectors. We wanted to expand it to many other countries. And we wanted to, you know, at the same time, we wanted to reduce risk as well, the, the personal risk to everyone. So we sold to them, which was, you know, hotly debated and contested internally. And, and some people loved the idea. Some people hated the idea. What side of the fence were you on? Um, so at the time, I was... I was a very junior partner, and I was against. Um, okay. I, you know, I wanted to remain independent. I didn't want to be tied into a bigger company. Um, but we actually had to vote in the end, and and the there was you know a threat looming over over you. you, you everyone can vote as the, as their conscience dictates, but if you voted no, you know you you might be out of a job as well. Mm. And so I was against, but I, I was a coward and I voted yes. <laughs> and anyhow, I think I think they got near unanimous um, yes vote. I can remember one or two people who, who didn't vote yes and ultimately did stay as well. But that, you know, the reason I highlight that too is it ultimately did power enormous growth for us because they had an existing consulting business called Mercer Management Consulting. Mm-hmm. Yeah that we basically combined with Oliver Wyman to make a much stronger business. And then just sort of the power of those two together, combined with the Marsh McLennan balance sheet, the ability to buy things, the broader reach they had everywhere, you know, really accelerated growth for a long period after that, and and still does today. Now, I want to touch on something, because we talk a lot of this podcast about the, the human side of the experience. It's not all. Um, it's not all about work and business. You go. Th- well, let's let's go back a bit. You meet a, a very special person when you're at Oliver Wyman through a friend who worked at Oliver My- Wyman. Uh, do you remember the first day you met? Yes, I remember. So, so I believe you're talking about my wife, who I'm still married to. That I've, is correct. I, <laughs> and I met her through a friend at Oliver Wyman. And I remember going out to, um, we went out to a bar with a whole gang of people. And I had another girlfriend at this time who was with me. Oh. Mm. Um, so, I met her, and I, I sort of noted in my mind that I really liked her. She was, she was lovely. But just because you're chat, you get just chatting? just chatting and yeah. and and talking about various things, and then, but you know that wasn't to be then. I, um, and it was only another year later I met her again. Oh, um, wow. when I didn't have a girlfriend, she didn't have a boyfriend, and 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 Where then. Where did you meet her? Again? Then I met her. I think I had a party that she came to with that same friend. Was that orchestrated? Did you have Pro- a little plan probably, going on here? Probably orchestrated. <laughs> um, <laughs> And then, and you know that, that it was wonderful for me because I I um I adored her at the time. I still adore her, but it was a great uh, stabilizing point in my life because you know. How you, old were you at this point? It's a good question. I think I was about thirty. Thirty. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, maybe even thirty-two or so. Right. So quite a late, you know, maybe a late marrier by by most standards. But it kind of is nice if you have a really good relationship like that. It stabilizes your personal life, so you can you can really devote um, time to your job. And I got very um, the match was great because I had these jobs that took a lot of time. She's a writer um, and write, writes novels and nonfiction books. That means though she has an unbelievable flexibility, so she can work wherever and whenever mm. um, she needs to. So it was a nice match for me. And I, you know, I often look to to friends who have who have partners where they have less and less of a nice match. You know, they they're either they both have too much to do or mm. or something similar, which is much harder to manage. I think. And what was your courting journey like? When did you eventually propose? How long? So it was all very fast. Um, I I think I moved. We moved in together after six months. Okay. And then in, in another six months after that, I took her to Canada to take her on a camping trip to test her out, see whether she was any good at nature. <laughs> nice. Um, nice. And then proposed to her there. And well, that, and that was that. Paint the scene. What happened? Did you 
get so, so I took you want to hear the, the really lake? romantic yeah thing. let's yeah. do it of <laughs> so I took her on a boat ride no I took her first of all canoeing um, okay where she um, twisted her ankle because I told her wearing flip flops was okay and it, it didn't work out for her <laughs> oh dear. but then I put her in a boat I took her to a waterfall Ooh, and romantic. and I produced oysters and no, I, you know, I should have had wine, but I had to drive the boat, so I had oysters and coffee, <laughs> and proposed to her by a waterfall. Oh, that's mm-hmm. cool. well, not bad. Yeah, probably the probably the ro- most romantic thing I've ever done. I haven't <laughs> replicated it that's since then. Well, you should. You know what? It's fourteenth uh, of February next week. No, so um, it's yeah. my it's my twenty fifth anniversary this year, 20. end of May. So I'll have to come up with something good then. You do what most couples do. You get married and you go to have children. Um, what happens next? We got married. We were sort of charging on in life. Things were going very well. We, I think we both had it. We both come from big families. Both had four kids in the family. Wow. And, and so our, our intent was to have a big family. Oh, really? So you wanted four kids, maybe? We wanted lots of kids. Four, five, six, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> have to ask Julia how, how many. But, um, but so charged ahead. It, not really recognizing that we were in our you know, mid-30s by this point. And so charged ahead, and it, it proved much harder than we thought it was going to be. Um, and, you know, un- unfortunately, we had sort of miscarriage after miscarriage after miscarriage through that period. And there was a, you know, multiple year period um, where, where we just could not seem to get it right. And, mm-hmm. and very, very tough on, on Julia. And, and, you know, I did what I could to, to support her. And then, you know, at the end of the period, I can't, I can't, in fact, I think I've blurred it out in my mind now. I can't remember exactly how long it was. You know, at the end, we did get lucky again. And, and I, I have a daughter now who's um, named Inesh. She's 19. Um, so it eventually worked. Um, we got one, not four, but um, she's a pretty special one. So, so that's okay. Reflecting on the journey through these mis- miscarriages, what do you think are the key lessons that you took from that that could help someone else that has gone through this too? The main lesson for me is, is that, is particularly as a man, you have to recognize sort of the profound physical and mental trauma this causes for for women, and I th- I do think you know the the pain they suffer is many many multiples what the man suffers, mm-hmm. um, and you know that that requires care, support, focus. Um, that's the main lesson, I think. Just describe that moment when, she, after years of, of very sad miscarriages, to be there on that day. I assume you're there. Um, <laughs> be there on that day when when she was born. Can yes, I, I was in there was with there? all the the gore and and stuff that happens. But um, no, it was fantastic and you know a wonderful experience, a wonderful relief. Although I think that experience is so good for anyone. I'm not sure ours was any better. Maybe it's combined with relief, but I mean, it's a great joy to, to see a being created and, and, um, and see them start to form themselves. Mm. Well, just briefly, what's she doing today then? She's 19, did you say? She's 19. She's studying screenwriting in, in the south of, south of London. She's never, she's never been particularly on the traditional path. She, she didn't do a level she did an acting course oh. um, and then she she sort of is now supplementing the acting course with screenwriting i think ultimately her goal is to uh write direct and act in movies so really how it goes these days <laughs> yeah. should have come today come to the shoot <laughs> she'd be more entertaining than me <laughs> <laughs> so back to the, the the your story so by the time you have your daughter um what year is that so she was born in 2004 that would make sense yeah um and your role is at this point yeah so i i started all over wyman in 95 i sort of worked my way um through the consulting ranks i got promoted to being a partner relatively quickly you know traditional path at a consulting firm would be 10 years all over wyman we were always faster that was one of the things we tried to promote and i joined more senior than most of the people there. So, well, I had to start at the very bottom. I, th- I think I got promoted in 2000. So I'd been there for 
for six years. So you were elected partner in 2000? So I got elected partner in 2000. And, you know, then partner in these places has its own whole series of ranks. So, you know, you start you start to learn your, your craft as a partner. Yeah, what, what is that? So for people who don't quite understand the structures of a management, management consultancy, what does being elected as a partner mean? So if you think about like the, the way a management consultancy is structured, some someone has to go out, find potential clients, you know, find people who have problems that you think you have the, the skills, capability, and people to help solve. Mm-hmm. Um, then they've got to negotiate with them and and um, you know agree, agree how we're going to do that, agree to get them to pay for it, and structure how we're going to actually solve it. Mm-hmm. Um, then you've got a team that would be in under them, which could be any anything from two people to 50 people, depending on what the job is. Mm-hmm. And they'd all be structured with slightly different skills and different roles. But the partner's job is the front end of all that. So find the clients, manage the relationships with the clients, um, find the the sales that we're actually going to make and the work we're going to do, help structure the whole team so we can solve it. Um, and then you know be there throughout the work and make sure it gets make sure it gets done and we do it properly we do it of a high standard and and deal with all the problems that happen through that mm-hmm. so it's sort of the you know it's like managing a mini firm almost each yeah. one of these each one of these projects and then everyone else's job is more specified like mm-hmm. you'll have a you know specific set of tasks you need to do or a specific role you're playing but the partner's looking over the over the whole thing and then the you know the other important differentiator is that usually in a consulting firm for most of them you know you're getting paid and you'll have a bonus of some sort partners then you know will be sharing in the income of the firm overall so they have more much more exposure to the ups and downs but also much more upside yeah and uh, uh Oliver Wyman what's a small deal What's an average deal and what's the big, in terms of money in from the client for, for a project, maybe, let's say? Yeah, so we, we would do a lot of work at Oliver Wyman that is, um, is I, hope that, I hope that this is going to sound ridiculous when you hear the numbers, but like really small there would have been a couple hundred thousand pounds or dollars mm-hmm. would be sort of a small one month type of tester project to get to know each other very small problem a um, couple of grand to get to know each other <laughs> sounds good <laughs> there you know typical project might might be a couple hundred grand i should say that's a couple of grand a couple hundred grand a couple hundred <laughs> typical project might be half a million pounds million pounds to do something but okay. this would be you know many months many people solving a, a really hard problem yeah um but we do we do projects as big as 50 100 million pounds as well um, those might be huge things like, you know, designing a tax system for a country that didn't have one. Mm. So you know, might might have fifty people working on it for years. Mm. They're all they're all you know scaled in terms of price by the amount of people we have working on them. So in the next six seven years, you are move you get you get um, elected again. Um, what, what what were you elected into, and what? Why you? What? So I became partner in two thousand. Sort of worked through life as a nor- normal partner, and trying to get. You know, what are you trying to do as a partner? You're trying to get better at what you do, develop more clients, sell more work, get you know get known in the market as someone who can help people solve things and and get stuff done. So I was doing that, sort of building out my portfolio of things. I eventually had positioned to, I was leading our work in, you know, what we called sort of institutional banking. So it was corporate banking, investment banking, asset management. I was I was leading a lot of that work. And then we had a period around 2006 when we were going to change the leader of the biggest part of Oliver Wyman, which I worked in at the time, which was the financial services practice, where we'd only had really two leaders in that business. We'd had Alex Oliver who started and a guy who followed him. And now this was the, is going to be the third change in, in the time we existed. And the, 
there were several great candidates at the time who were running bigger businesses than me and had bigger roles. And I actually had had never given any thought to having this role, um, never positioned for it, never contemplated it, not wasn't even sure I wanted it. But but it, we ended up, it was a strange time because the, there was sort of a, a real difference of opinion in terms of where we would take the consulting firm at the time. And there were kind of two camps um, who had different views, some people within that who had different views. And I think the broader partner group, which was probably 400 people at the time or so. Partner uh, group, 400 people, what does that mean? So that, there'd be four, 400 partners, right. yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, I think that maybe there was a, maybe there was a few less at the time, right. roughly, so something like that. Yeah. And I think they they suddenly turned on the existing leadership of the place Ooh. and, oh, and, thought, and thought, yeah. thought we needed something totally new. And they started prodding people, you know, more junior people across the group, and including me, and said, you know, throw your hat into the ring here. Give your views. And, and this will be how old? This would have been 2006. So I would, that's like 20 years ago. So I was like late 30s. Late 30s. Yeah. Okay. They said, throw your hat into the ring, share your ideas, and this will be, you know, this will be good for your career. Everyone will see, see you and see, hear some more ideas. And I did that. Um, and so you did it not thinking you'd get it or really wanted it? I didn't it. think I'd get it. And I hadn't really planned to get it. And then I won I won the vote. Wow. Nice. So, so who votes? So that's all the partners vote. Right. Um, Landslide or? I'm not sure they ever <laughs> revealed <laughs> whether it was tight or not. Yeah. But, you know, so I was chosen. The partners had decided that I would run that part of the business. Mm -hmm. And... Um, uh, and what does that mean? Like, so that was seventy percent of the company's revenue. Was it's it? about seventy percent of Oliver Wyman at the time. Okay, and which is the largest what, percentage, obviously. Yeah, and what what it meant for me was suddenly I had shifted from being, you know, I knew by this point how to be a partner. I knew how to go out and find clients and how to do projects and how to do things that I thought were useful for people. Suddenly, I had a very different job. It's like now your job is to run the consulting firm and think about the, you know the system we have and make everyone more productive rather than you know we have lots of people out there trying to sell work and do projects and stuff. That's not your job anymore. Your job is to make us all productive through thinking about you know what direction are we going, what type of products and services are we going to have, how do we organize, um, and I think it's a like this was my first taste of the, the, the really hard leap you make when you move from, especially in the professions, you know, if it's something like banking or, um, or consulting or many of the other professions, you know, you've trained at this, you're really good at it, you know how to do it, you, you know the model. Then all of a sudden you have a different job, and they've given you that because you were good at this. So suddenly you're the you're the CEO or you're the managing partner, as I was of financial services, and everyone assumes you will also be good at that. Yeah. And are you thinking, oh my gosh, I don't know how to do this. I've never done this before. What? Yes, I, I was thinking all of that stuff, um, and was quite terrified. Uh, it, the nice thing is in a consulting firm at least. So this was good early training for me. I mean, no one in a consulting firm thinks of the CEO as the way you do in a typical corporation. Like mm -hmm. here's someone ma magnificent sitting here who gets to make all the decisions and we will all follow. The consulting firm, you know, grudgingly has given you a role that they're all watching very closely and helping you with, and they all think they could do the job if they focused on it as well. But it means you get enormous support from across the group. You get lot, lots of good input, lots of good guidance, more feedback than you would ever want on on things that you're doing well and not well. So it's like a it's a great treadmill of constant development. So when you're thinking, oh my gosh, I don't know what to do, what do you do like and so someone can learn if they're ever in that position or in that position now they take on a big new role where they go up to you know new, new what did, what did you do you get you get tons of input 
you know, so, so it's like, okay, day one, we'll help you. This is what you do today. Or are you, are you going out to get that? Input? So I'm going out to get it from all the people who'd done that job before. So all what the kind other of questions are you asking them? I'm, I'm asking them, how would they approach it? How would they mm -hmm. think about the team? How would, you know, what are the things they would focus on? Um, you get all sorts of consultants of a different type that pop up and say, like, you need a hundred day plan and Here's what here's what you need. I'm not sure I did need that, but I've heard I, that before. Yeah, yes. that you say <laughs> plan. Um, the classic. So, yeah. but so, but in effect, you do have to form. You know, what is your what is your plan? How are you going to spend your time? What are you going to do? And how are you going to you know start to because to be effective, you need credibility in these roles. So, how are you going to start to build credibility? Um, and then, did you speak to your father about advice around this? So, my dad was sort of my main advisor in my life and so he he would have been um heavily consulted you know on on most of this stuff unfortunately he was right around this period i don't remember the exact year but you know i was in this i was in this role when we had the financial crisis if you remember when lehman brothers folded and well, just set the scene for this. Cause yeah, it's quite unique, isn't it? How you were told and where you were. Yes. So, so I'd been so I'd been in the Oliver Wyman role for some time. The financial industry is about to melt down. It's possible, you know, hopefully not likely, but it's possible we go bankrupt because wow. of this. You know, banks are going bankrupt all around us. Everyone's in a panic. Our work for for the short term is dried up. We need to organize so that we can be useful for the industry as fast as we can. Mm. So well, you should be in the office and amongst it, sleeping in the office, just managing the situation, no? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Now, right in the midst of this, I'd basically taken on this role, uh, the bigger role. We had a, you know, the financial markets were melting down at this point, although hadn't fully melted down. No one quite knew what was happening. Um, and then all of a sudden at this period, you know, my, my dad, who was my, my main advisor, really, he died suddenly and it was in, he was in his late sixties only mm -hmm. very healthy, robust, um, guy. And he had a, a, a strange heart thing that, that took him out almost instantly. And I, 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 you know, I wasn't able to get over to Canada to, in time to even say goodbye. And he was just, he was gone. What do you remember that what happened the day you found out the news? Were you at the office and did someone call you or? So I was at I was at home. My mum called me to tell me she was at the hospital and he'd he'd um, yeah I can't remember. I think they were trying to get him in for the operation. They couldn't even get him to the operating room at all. It all happened so quickly. And um, then she said to you that. And she said he he died, and I, I was actually at home, and I just remember feeling unbelievably sort of bereft at this point because he was a, it was a mix of I don't know how many people have this relationship with their dads, but it was a mix, you know, main advisor, best friend, yeah, you know, someone I talked to about most things. Mm -hmm. um, so suddenly he was gone, um, and so I went. I did get back to Canada then for the funeral and to to help my mom out with everything that had to be done, um, and was still trying to process this. You know, you you probably um, concluded by now that, that you know I'm not a particularly. I don't wear my emotions very much on my sleeve, so it takes me some time to process these things. And I yeah. I decided to go fishing with my brother the next week up in northern Quebec. Because I was going to go with my dad, actually. Oh, we had a trip God. planned, oh, yeah. and I thought, I'll keep keep the same trip. I'll just go with my brother. We'll celebrate his life and have some fun. Mm -hmm. And then the, the first night we were fishing, I got a call in the lodge in the middle of the night, and they, they came and woke me up and said, um, Lehman Brothers has collapsed. And so... And Lehman Brothers in association with... Why is, so what? they they probably were some sort of client of ours at the time, but the more significant thing was, you know, the whole financial sector was on the verge of collapse. No one knew what was going to happen. So, you know, I was processing the, the grief from my dad dying, I was sitting in this fishing lodge where they only had, it was like a payphone, <laughs> and trying to deal with the, the London and New York offices of Oliver Wyman to figure out you know, what we're going to say to our staff the next morning, what we're going to mm -hmm. say to clients. Now, 
it's not as if I was doing this all. We had probably hundreds of people around the world focused on on what to do. But, but you, I'm it, just was it one of those little red boxes like we have in London, <laughs> or it was even more rudimentary, I think, because it's like a fishing lodge in the north of Quebec that has this strange old style phone on there <laughs> yeah. that barely works. Is it inside, or you just have outside? It was I'm, inside, I'm, inside the place. <laughs> okay, and so. Um, you know, that was a t that was a tough time because we had to manage our way through that crisis. I was trying to figure out how to manage, you know, the, the loss of my dad. I think still, you know, it's taken me, this is many years ago now, but it's taken me, you know, probably I haven't even got there quite yet. You know, I know, I know he's gone. I still often think of, you know, when something good happens to me or even when something bad happens to me, I think I, I need to tell him. Wow. Um, and, and of course, he's not there. Yeah. What's that like to to deal with? It, so I the way I've rationalized it to myself is, you know, it's it's sad and hard, but it's also a form of growing up. You know, when when your dad dies, it's probably the same if if you have that kind of relationship with your mum and your mum dies. Um, luckily, mine is is still alive. Um, you know, you're on your own now. This is it. There's there's no, there's no backstop, so you're you're out there working on your own. My question was, yeah. So, in times of crisis like that, as a leader, what would you say the things you should do are, and the things that you shouldn't do are? So you've heard this news, you now know. Okay, I've got to speak to the UK. I've got to speak to New York. I've got to keep everyone together. What are your keys to success for someone else who may face some, that kind of challenge? So I think that the mistakes I've made in times of crisis over time are reacting too fast. You, you, you have an enormous burden when a crisis happens because you've got all these people that work with you or for you who you feel responsible for. You've got all your clients who you feel responsible for and often there's some other thing you feel responsible for. So you want to get back fast with, you know, this is what's going to happen. This is how we're going to handle it. This is what we're going to do. Here's some communications to try and deal with some of these things. And you often overreact, I think, and you, you go too much in haste. And I think what, I, what I've gotten better at over time is just a little more patience to say, let's really think this through. Let's get it right. I know everyone wants to hear something within one hour, but I'm going to be able to give them something a lot better after 24 hours. Um, but, it, but it takes some, I think, maturity and practice to get there. Because you get a lot of people saying to you, you got to get something out, you know, in the next hour. Mm. We, we had some interesting advice from Craig Spence, who's chief uh, brand officer for the International Paralympic Committee. And he was there when Oscar Pistorius shot and right. killed his wife. And his advice, so that was the crisis they had to deal with, who he was the poster boy for the Paralympics, um, his advice was take up as much of the, the, the new space as possible. Otherwise someone else is, someone's going to fill that space and you're, it's good to get out there. And it, they did 50 interviews in period of 72 hours or something, um, just to make sure that it was their voice that was being heard and not somebody else's. Um, which is an interesting take on it. Which strikes me as definitely, like I'm, I, I haven't had too many crises that have required media work like that. I see. And I don't think I'm much of an expert on, on the media, but, but it feels like good advice. That <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully you won't need it. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm just wondering, as you say it, how much that applies to like, because cause you can, you have a bit of the same thing internally. You know, if you're not yeah. if you're not commenting, lots of people are commenting on yes. on what what's going on. Um, but I still think what I've learned is just a little bit slower on that to to get your message better formed. So the point at which you become CEO um, is this 2012 president of Oliver Wyman or yeah, so that. So that would be 2012. You're named president. Is that the same as CEO? It was the same, yeah. So this was a slightly different thing. So at this point, we're owned by Marsh McLennan. Okay. And um, the CEO of Oliver Wyman um, 
is it, actually I'll tell you how I became president and CEO too. So mm -hmm. the, the, yeah. the CEO of Oliver Wyman was the person who ran the consulting group. So the old Oliver Wyman, everything that was left of Mercer Management Consulting. And we had some other businesses, a, a branding firm called Lippincott, an economic consulting firm called Nira, um, and a few other bits and bobs. And so that role was sort of running that group and sitting on the executive committee of Marsh McLennan. That's what it came with. First meeting I went to at Marsh McLennan, um, I was looking at everyone's titles and everyone else was president and CEO of their unit, you know, president and CEO of Marsh, president and CEO of Mercer, President and CEO of Guy Carpenter, and I was CEO of Oliver Wyman. Oh, you were like, uh, where's the P? Where's and I, sa P? I yeah. said, why am I not CEO and president? And I was. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't ask, you don't get <laughs> for it. every level. <laughs> so, but that was 2014, right? When you became group CEO. Is that when you became group CEO or you you were on the, on the, McCl oh no. I think they were the same. That it was It was 2012 when I became group CEO basically it was the same thing there was not two different things I yeah. see okay um so why you how do you why did they choose you to be CEO of one of the biggest management consultancy firms in the world so at this point I had more of a natural path and some more you know an obvious route because I um that previous job had, had put me in the position of running the biggest part of Oliver Wyman by some margin um, compared to everything else. So I already had a fair amount of profile in the Oliver Wyman group, you know, group management team. I mean, you've been there it's almost 20 years at this point. Might have got yeah, 15. 15, yeah. Mm. Um, I've been there 15 years, so I'm, so I'm well known. And so the positioning is good because people can look and see what's happened with the business, how it's gone. Um, but it was by no means certain. And there, there were several other people, um, you know, in, in contention for the role, many of whom are just absolutely remarkable people and could have, could have uh, done it, no doubt. And, and during that period, do you, is it get a bit icy when you chat to them? Is it a bit... You... Yeah, it, I found it quite stressful because you know I just didn't know what was going to happen um you of course you maintain like you've got, you've been working together with these people for many many years so there's cordial relationships but you know there's strong competition at that point and unlike the previous job you know this was a job i did want ah. I, I did want um i thought i had you know reasonable claim to be in contention for it amongst the others although you know i I, it was clear to me that the others were also really, really good. And so it was going to be more than just a measurement of who had done best. You know, someone had to think about what was needed, what's the fit, still what did the partners want, and, and then all the stuff you, you just can't really predict will happen. You know, what do the times need? So you get the role. Uh, they obviously liked your pitch. What was your pitch? I think my, I mean, the, I can't really remember the whole picture. Or, at the or time. do you have advice if someone is going for a that step up? They maybe have a head of department, director, or maybe they're in the C-suite and they want that next step up to the C-suite or to CEO. Um, what's your advice on how to present to, to for the people above to to say, yeah, it should be you? I think you need to have a a clear and concise plan with a handful of things that you're going to do. Ra so not too many. Not yeah. too many, rather than commenting on, you know, all of the hundreds of things that do need to be done, probably. There should be more straws in the kitchen. Yeah. Don't the, go to that level. There's probably in no more science to the answer to that question than just like, how do you do a marketing pitch? You've got to focus in on, on what you can do, what your strengths are, but what are the main things you will focus on? Yeah. I see. Um, and and realize who you're speaking to. You know, by that point, you're speaking to board members, lots of people who've done it before. Um, and you know, the thing I took away from my early life as well is, you know, this is not a time to be indifferent about whether you want the job or not, mm -hmm. um, or have lack of passion. I think again, one of the things everyone is looking for there is is you know, real real grit, real passion for the thing. 
but natural judgment. They're trying to decide, like, we're going to give someone the keys to make a lot of decisions here. So do we trust their judgment? Well, they did. And yes. you were named as president and well, CEO and finally president as well. Um, what did you do? How would you describe what was your actual role? Like, what was your role as CEO? What was your responsibility? So, so even more so than the previous job, you ended up stepping you know, away from the core business yeah. and focusing on structure and systems. So I had some big things to do still about bringing all of Oliver Wyman together. Um, what does that mean? So we still had, you know, we still had bits of Mercer, bits of Oliver Wyman, all those other places I mentioned, they operated largely independently. So how did we bring them together make it a stronger operation that mm. people were still happy to work for. The the other thing you got to remember in management consulting, it's quite a unique business because people, it's like almost like running a baseball team. You have all these free agents who mm. are highly talented. Most of them could leave tomorrow and you know get a similarly paid job somewhere else. So they're not trapped there. They don't have to be there. So you've got to be providing them this platform that they think is attractive, you know, good for them, they can contribute to. And so, you know, lo making changes in consulting is really tricky because if you have a, you can come up with a plan and say, this is what we're going to do to put the businesses together. You know, here's who will be leading them. Here's how we're going to structure. It's not inconceivable. You find the next day you, you, you have half the partners wow. and, and the, the place oh, wow. collapses. So, so how did you do it? How did you bring the company together without half of them leaving? What, what, what did you firstly? Like, how did you bring the company together? Like, for any, somebody who doesn't know how to restructure, but they might get in themselves into that role, or they maybe want to just hear from you how you restructured theirs because they need to restructure their business. I mean, the the kind of things we had to think about were how do you define separation or togetherness? It it, it tends to be. Like, do you have the same underlying processes around the businesses or not? Mm. So, for instance, do you have the same compensation model? Do you calculate how we pay people in the same way you know, with the same methodology? And, you know, at that time for us, the, the answer was still no. We all paid people differently in different parts of the oh, business. So, mm. you know, there's a whole series of things like that. Do, do we have the same titles across the place? Is it important? Does anyone care? Does it help us if we do? Do we have the same promotion processes and training regimes and things like that? And so we had to make a lot of decisions through that period about which of these things are, do you get sort of a power of diversity by having different things? And which do we think we'd get power from having a single platform? Mm. Um, and yeah, these create a, a lot of emotion in a consulting firm if you ta start to talk about changing people's pay or, or changing how you train them or changing how you promote them or changing even things like the back office. You know, do, do you all have the same finance platform or HR platform or do you each get to have a different platform? What did you decide on for the finance side? So for almost all of the back office things, we, we put one platform into place. Mm -hmm. What platform did you use? Oh gosh, that's that's more more um, technology than I know. Okay. <laughs> but it, by platform, I wasn't so much talking about the tech platform, but like we had one finance function that then cut across everything, used the same processes, and did use whatever the tech platform they used yeah. was the same yeah. one. So we put most of that together. We did change things like like pay and promotion and titles, um, did some small things that seemed not that important but were quite symbolic in terms of moving people around, making them sit in offices together um, rather than all separating out into their their own teams. So explain that in, in detail for someone who might want to do the same. What did you do? I mean, that was as simple as basically the, you know, the Oliver Wyman groups all grouped together in, in the old units in in offices and we just literally forced them to sit together in offices around the place so were they in different buildings or just in different parts some of the different building? buildings some in different parts of the building and you just it, it's rather than having the consulting guys over here and the branding guys over here we tried to move more and more together you know okay. with some it, with some sensitivity sometimes things do need to be 
sat together to do certain types of work. So we, we did things like that. What was the thinking behind that? It was just to get the, you know, I think if people don't know each other, they demonize mm. each other. And it's very easy to sit in a room of 10 of your your gang and demonize the other gang. It becomes tribal. Yeah, it? and if you actually know them and get to know them and understand what their families are doing and the challenges they're facing, then they become human and you don't demonize mm. them anymore. I think it's as He's all right, that Scott, actually. I had yeah. lunch with him. <laughs> he's, he's okay. You know, that kind of thing happens. And it? if you think of that like playing out hundreds of times every day, it, it can have a big impact. Yes, fostering so th- cohesion. So that's what we did, you know, during those years. And I, I it's these prob- these processes are probably never done in a consulting firm. So... Okay. I wouldn't claim for a second to have nailed it all and finished it, but you know we continued to move through that process. We continued to work a lot on, you know, how do we deliver value in an underlying way to our clients? So how do we structure and, and what are we actually selling them? What do we have that's useful? Um, and just tried to put a lot of, it, it, I think just brain power into thinking it isn't just we're we're not going out there and saying we have some knowledge we have some skills it's it's yeah you know, what we latched onto is this idea of we're out here selling impact so we need to be very clear with you describing to you what how we define impact what it means how we measure it and how we deliver it so there's, there's a lot of that goes on could you take us through your strategic plan that you had at Oliver Wyman and how you were able to align some of your long-term goals with some of the shorter-term things that had to happen. I do think one of the challenges, the the more senior you get, is like one of the big things on your plate is align the short-term with the long-term mm-hmm. and make sure they both work. And so what we were always thinking about at Oliver Wyman was, you know, where are we going over a, a five- or ten-year period in terms of design? the design of what our offer is, how we're organized, but how are we going to deliver the short-term economics that we need to pay people to satisfy our shareholders? And and every CEO has this challenge. I mean, it's, it's the thing you've always got to be explaining to your board how you're reconciling. And then how did Oliver Wyman adapt the business strategies in response to the market changes? I think it Consulting is a little different than other businesses because you are you're selling a service that constantly adapts. Mm. You know, if you run if you run a car company, you're manufacturing a product product and through time you have to, you know, make changes to the product based on what people want and make it more efficient and and that's one like this whole manufacturing mindset is one. Consulting is a real service mindset in that we're constantly having to monitor what our clients are doing and what they need and what what's considered a f- sophisticated need and what's not. So during you know during my time in consulting over the 25 years I mean it's quite shocking when I think about how the value had changed. When when I started the fact that we could do you know high level mathematical statistical modeling and do a lot of analysis was hugely valued from consultants Mm -hmm. and that that wasn't in the business world Mm -hmm. typical business people didn't know how to do that or didn't know how to do it very well so they paid a lot of money to get that sort of analysis from us you you look at the world now no one pays for that Mm -hmm. i mean they've got that all in-house um or or it's very cheap to get so you're constantly in consulting like dumping a bunch of the stuff you've done and saying, what is the next thing that's actually mm. of, of value? What is that now? If you were going to start a consultant, consultancy, a management consultancy firm today, what would you, how would you set it up? What kind of business would you set I up? I think the thing that, that continues to be enormously valuable now is the, the kind of end-to-end link to you, when you take action, do you create impact? And that that's a complicated link that is very fertile ground for consulting because it there you have to get you know the actions right, the leadership right, the supporting structure around change. You know, what what do you need to actually drive change in an organization? Um, and you need the vision that sits behind all that. But 
that's the kind of thorny problem that you know people still still are very happy to pay for because if if you can say you know our approach to all of this the way we put it together the way we link things together will create this impact in the end which we can agree how to measure people will be happy to pay for that and what is there a broad set of typical measurable impacts let's say that um that that would fit under so what what are you usually measuring yeah the different categories so there's a set of things that are easy to measure and a set of things that are are harder to measure um and so you you normally would have a combination of both the things that are easy to measure are you know are you growing in the areas you expected as fast as expected are they as profitable as you, as you'd hoped and is the profitability changing in the way you had hoped and that could you know, that could be cost cutting that could be new products it could be growth in some other country so there's a whole bunch of things around that that you can measure and you you can agree you know we'll do all this work you can say whatever you want about your techniques and stuff but we're going to look in the end and see did it actually grow mm. or 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 did we make more money from doing it? And then I think there's a set of softer things that are harder. Like, have we made the culture more robust? Are people less likely to leave us? You know, are they more aligned and you know giving more focus to the organization than they did before? And you can try and measure these things through through some hard things like, you know, are you actually retaining people and mm. do do you find it easier to recruit people through staff surveys and stuff like that? And there's a bunch of stuff you probably can't measure. But I think people can feel in terms of the health of an organization. You know, is it a honest organization with integrity, or, or are they cutting corners everywhere? So, what do you do when when you're saying we're going to deliver this impact, and it's one of those areas that are hard to measure? Do you just find a way to measure it, or do you? How do you? How do you I think in the, I think in the end you've got to find something to measure. Um, and then it probably depends on your relationship with the client, how how freewheeling you can be in terms of what you're going to measure. But most of the things, like even most of those soft things, in the end, they have a hard impact. So you can you can always have some hard measure to look at. Could you describe some of the operational metrics that Oliver Wyman focuses on to ensure efficiency and effectiveness within its service delivery? Yeah. So that. The question I think I think what you're asking is you know how do you make a consulting firm hum well or run well, mm. yeah, um, and that you know that that would include everything for us. Yeah, you know, our business, at, the Oliver Wine business, is all about people. So so it's how effective are we at attract attracting you know the highest quality people, and that's the thing we focus on enormously because mm. without that we we haven't really got uh, um, a start. And then there's lots of metrics we would measure around, you know, and then how effective are we at retaining and developing people? Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of work we used to do in terms of, you know, sk- what is the skill path people should go through? How how do they acquire skills, and how do we measure whether they're actually getting them and 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 reward them in the right way for that? Mm-hmm. And so, a lot of stuff around people that goes all the way through leadership and and. You know, consulting firms really think about development right from the bottom to the top. And even when you're a top leader, you have a pretty brutal development plan. Mm-hmm. You know, you're supposed to be getting better on all of these things every year that, that you get input on. So that'd be a set of things. Um, then we need to, um, like everyone else, you know, get constantly better and cheaper at delivery. So we've got we've got a pretty smart ruthless client base you know across areas who people don't tend to naturally like management consultants so they're they're quite hard on them Mm. and they're they're constantly looking to say to see you know what did this cost us how many people did it take you to do and what did it do did it do anything useful for us or not and if it didn't we don't you know we'll never use you again Mm. and that's why it's so important to deliver impact and measure it yeah and even if it did you know, the, the next thing is, okay, well, we expect you to learn from that as well and be able to do it for, you know, now that you've learned a bunch of stuff too, let's be able to do the next thing faster and slightly yeah. cheaper um, and and get even more out of that. So, you know, then you're into kind of normal stuff. How, how do you run your whole back office um, most, most efficiently? You know, especially if you've got operations all around the world. And how do you run your 
sort of front office teams most efficiently. Um, and but that stuff, I think, it you know, it becomes more standard across across uh, businesses. And I think that a lot of industries can learn from this the management consultancy industry or consultancy is that this idea of knowing and planning and doing something about it that what your the services you're offering now are going to get commoditized and we're going to have to create something new to stay relevant stay ahead of the game to keep growing um it's really i think a lot of our industries can learn from that because most industries you know know what they do well and they stick to that for a long time and it and then they sort of see a startup you know doing something innovatively or an sme and then they buy them and try to integrate that in-house mm -hmm. but the actual core of the business is still very old-fashioned and so doesn't always work out um and i think so we have a lot of people from advertising agencies on the show something advertising can probably learn a lot from is it's the consultant industry maybe the music industry too maybe um, architecture, there's a lot of industries across the creative that could learn from it. Do you, do you think so? I think the two most valuable things consultants have, which others can learn from, you know, the first is not actually that. I think the first is how we um, train and develop and value and reward people through time mm. um, by necessity. We don't have anything else. We're not very capital heavy. We often don't have, we don't have any products. We, we might have you know, some things we built over time, but not much. So we have to have a model that is really attractive for people to work in. So we spend a ton of time in that industry thinking about the best ways to develop people, the best ways to treat people, the best ways to get the best out of them. And I think there, I, I haven't come across a sector that is as good at, at, at that. And can you just share how did you develop people really well? Like what, what, what have you learned from that aspect? Of, it's very important to develop them. What has worked really well? So I think, I think what we were always good at there is, is a concept of constant development and progression. So one of the things I found, you know, as I get closer to government is you can come into the government and get a job and do the next thing for the the same thing for the next 10 years. And we had the luxury in consulting of not doing that. You constantly had to move. And in order to move, you had to develop new skills because you had to do different things. And so there was a really well thought out methodology of what skills are you trying to develop? What, what do you need to develop those? Which means that every year you're doing a different job. And you, you're, you're broadening out different skills. You're deepening other skills. And every year you get more and more and more. So by the time you you, you get to your, your eight or ten years and you, and you hopefully get promoted to becoming a partner, you're an incredibly well-rounded um, business person mm -hmm. and you can do all sorts of things. And I don't think anyone else um, does, that, does that as well. The, now, what, what you were talking about, Charles, the... Um, um, I don't think we're quite as good. You know, we we are good at reinventing ourselves in the consulting world. I think there's other industries that are also good at that. You know, you mentioned advertising or a place like that. I think we also have stuff to teach people, but they're probably good at it naturally as well. I mean, that that world turns over like crazy. Um, so it's probably a more service industry phenomena. I see, but I think it's it is an interesting dynamic. There is that the the, the consultancy firms coming into the world of advertising we've seen with Accenture and Deloitte um, and and really taking a lot of the market um, in the way that they do things and uh, it's um it seems yeah there's this culture of we, we have to change and evolve and the advertising especially traditional advertising is seen as traditional and slow moving and that's the challenge I think one, one of the things I always found interesting about consulting too is that because you have no products you have nothing so you get very quick feedback on whether what you're having mm -hmm. what you have is good yeah um, so if you don't keep up with the pace and evolve very quickly it's very easy to suddenly have you know as a partner in a consulting business have no revenue whatsoever 
um because everyone can turn you off like that they, mm -hmm. they don't have they don't have very long-term things with you even a long-term one-year project i mean after that you have to you have to earn it all over again and every year kind of starts at zero again and so you also you mentioned it's important to to develop people and 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 give them skills so what can people what have you seen work really well and what can other industries learn about mm -hmm. the way you train people like what kind of training do people get and and what have you seen that's worked really well so i think the thing i i always really liked about what we did at oliver wyman was there's all sorts of basic skills that everyone teaches across sectors whether those are you know how to analyze how to structure how to present how to communicate and you need to you need their important skills and we worked on those as well but we spent a lot of time trying to work on this combination between soft skills and hard skills and soft skills we thought were very much about knowing yourself and accepting yourself um, being quite introspective and recognizing the impact that had on how you acted how you responded and how you behaved and if you could master that in a way you suddenly became a far more effective um, mm. consultant. Why? Why? Well, because you understood you know, when you got angry or when you got frightened or when you got really enthusiastic, you, you were able to relate that back to, well, that has something to do with me beyond just the stimulus I'm seeing. It has something to do with my background, the, the way I'm made up, the way I respond to things, which gives you, a, I think, a more accurate assessment of what's actually happening mm -hmm. you know to, to try and trivialize it a bit like often you'll you'll be talking to someone you'll you'll have a small dispute about something and you get really angry mm -hmm. um and you know that without that introspection what you think is well this jerk here has got something wrong and you know then they're and they're they're being rude or you know they're going too slow or something like that if you actually think hard off and you, you you know, not always, but sometimes you'll come to the conclusion, actually, I have something really wrong here. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is a defense mechanism or I don't like it when people criticize this type of thing or something like that. So we spent a lot of time on that. And th but this is hard stuff because it requires people to really think about themselves and be open and honest. And that that means the culture has got to be able to sustain that because it, it it's quite unique to get that to work. So we had a set of soft skills like that, set of hard skills, tried to merge those together. And if you get that right, it's very inspiring for people because they really believe they're developing. Do you think many industries are applying this? They're training in soft skills, in hard skills as much as... No. I, I mean, I think, I think most industries are not particularly good at training. I think they train the specific hard skills that are needed for that industry. Mm -hmm. They might touch on some of this other stuff and have the occasional leadership course or or something like that, which are probably good. Um, but I, it, the way we always went at it, I thought was more, was deeper than that. And I could really see a profound effect on a lot of our partners. So these would be people who'd been in doing what we did for 20 years very successful and all of a sudden you know completely changing approach and attitude and behavior because they, they've almost like had an epiphany realizing you know now that i look at this really carefully i understand much more so i i will act differently or i may in fact do something differently you, you always have a danger i think because um we we also had people who we really woke up to things and then they said you know what i've woken up to is i don't want to be at oliver wyman anymore <laughs> wow yeah, because it sounds like it's a very observational industry, that one, in terms of, number one, observing what you need to know to do the job well and to, to consult in the right way. But then the more that you grow, the more that you'll know that the more you need to know about yourself in order to then know more about people, to get on with them better, to build stronger rapport and to ultimately do your job better. We could use you as a trainer, I think. <laughs> <laughs> it's well put. <laughs> Do you think that other industries will be forced to catch up in this in this area? Like they will get to a point where 
this is just the, the way to go. You're going to have to train and develop your people. Otherwise, your industry as a whole is going to suffer and other industries will take over. Um, and is that happening already? What, what's your thought on that? I think it's really important. I think it's really hard because it's incredibly expensive to do properly. Um, most industries can't afford it. How much do you know? How much you're investing per head on train on skills, uh, soft skills training, for example? Or training? You know, I I don't, but it would have been in the, you know, in the tens of thousands per head. Per head. Per head. Yeah. At wow. what level? It's certainly at the senior levels, but probably at the junior levels as well. But I, I'm just making that number up because I don't know the number, but it would have been a lot. Um, and was there ROI on that? We, we, do you get yeah, that we're, back? Yeah, we're convinced it's, it's it, and we can see that as sort of people progress through and become more valuable to the, to the organization, um, that I think the investment is worth it. Um, but, but like I said, not many, not many organizations can afford that. So it's, but if you can, it's a smart strategy. Let's say you are in the music industry, you're a record label, or you're in, you are an architecture firm, or you are an advertising agency, and um, and you, if you if you made it a strategy that this is going to be our competitive advantage, that we're going to invest tens of thousands, or maybe thousands to begin with, in our senior staff in soft skills training. Do you think that would really that has the potential to help them grow as an organization. I think it. Pro I think it probably does. I mean, there. What one of the. I'm not a big reader of management books. But there's a few I've read over time that I love, and there's one called the. It's a slightly funny title. It's called the deliberately developmental organization. Um, and the sort of underlying thesis of it is that, what gives most organizations enormous um, market power is development of people but this is not a this is not a program you run it's not a training program people go to it's not a set of courses it's like an entire philosophy about how you develop people constantly and always and this is your strength you know you're developing people so you will in the end have better people than everyone else mm. um, and it's a really interesting book. It has several case studies of, of you know, where they've tried this, ranging from the extreme to the less extreme. But it's something I always bought into. And you, so you need to sort of try and bake this into the organization. I found moving from Oliver Wyman then into the British Council, you know, one of the frustrations I've had is I would like to do way more development at the British Council. Um, we can't afford to do as much as we could at Oliver Wyman, so we're going to have to do it in a different way. Um, but we start at a you know, relatively low base in terms of our training of people across the organization, so I'm hoping over time I can make progress there. Mm. Well, that's it. Hopefully you can start to show the impact mm -hmm. and measurable results on the company of doing it and unlocks more budget to, to do it. Mm. Um, it's yeah. interesting you say that because Karen Blackett, OBE is uh, UK president of WPP, the, one of the world's largest advertising um, holding companies. And, uh, and when we ask her what's her role as president, she says she's a performance coach. Like that is her role right. to get the best out of her people. So it seems like sh she would resonate a lot with what you're saying there. Is it's about really yeah, upskilling and getting the, the best out of the people. Um, that's going to help your company grow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I think that's right. And you, you, um, it has so many benefits because it obviously helps you grow, but it makes them more satisfied and they stay. Yeah. So then you mentioned there the, the, the differences in the two, your old organization and where you are now. Mm -hmm. So we get to 2021 and you make a decision that moves you from Oliver and Wyman to a new organization. Why did you make this change? I'd been the CEO at Oliver Wyman for nearly a decade. Um, I had in front of me at the time a few options to go and do even much bigger jobs um, in the corporate world. And I just sort at of- the same company or different companies? Or both? Different companies. Oh, um, can you tell us? 
can I tell you what companies? Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> but so, large, big, large, multi-billion yeah, dollar big, organizations. Big, big, large companies. Big yeah. salaries. Um, and and I, I really come to sort of a crossroads in my life, though, just thinking, what do I want to do next? Mm. So for, for a decade, I've been loving running Oliver Wyman. I loved the place. It was like a family. Everyone there was close to me. Um, it was very, it was a very lucrative job to have, um, very fulfilling in many ways. But I'd done it for a decade, and I was feeling okay. If I do it another year, it's going to be the exact same stuff I did last yeah. year. And you also you reach a point. For me, it was the thing that sort of really twigged in my mind is you know, the partners would be coming to me with a big issue they had or a problem, and I was beginning to feel irritated and frustrated by this. Mm. And it sort of dawned on me quite quickly at that point, okay, so it's time for you to go. Mm. Because it, that's not, if, as soon as you think that, you're not going to be very effective. You need to think, when they come to you with a problem, you need to be thinking, ah, like, what's the best way to try and solve this problem? And let, let's think about it creatively and do something. Um, but that's not how I was thinking then. So I decided it was time to go. I sort of put into motion a succession plan where, where various people were, were eligible for that, and we sort of had a, something in motion going on. It, the succession was going to be quite clear. But I still had no idea what I was going to do. And one of the people over time who I worked with a lot, um, a guy named David Noble, who's one of the world's great coaches, mm -hmm. um, he, he, he was working with me on, like, how do you figure out what do you want to do next? At, um, and talking to me about all sorts of things across life, not only professional things. And one of the many things he asked me to do is he said, put together a list of 20 people um, that you want to talk to about this. And I put together a list and showed, I showed it to him. And he said, this is like the worst list I've ever seen. This is just people you know and have worked with. You know, Put together an inspirational list of people you would love to talk to that you don't know, you've never met. And, and one of the things he said to me is, you're never going to have the power you have now. Like People will actually take your call as the head of Oliver Wyman. Yeah. He said, the, the day you finish being head of Oliver Wyman, no one's going to take your call anymore. Mm. So you've got to do it now. Great advice. So, yeah. so I, I put together a new list of 20 really interesting people. Mm -hmm. And he said, okay, this is good. So now get in touch with each one of them and explain to them your situation. You know, you're mid-50s. You want to make a change in career. You, you see that they've had an extraordinary career. They've made a bunch of changes. Mm -hmm. How did they make their decisions? Do they have any advice that would be useful for, as a framework for you to make your decisions? Who was on that list? So, you know, everyone from... Um, the head of McKinsey at the time, there was a prime minister on that mm -hmm. list. There were lots of people in different sectors, the museum sector, journalists, people who I just sort of watched over time and admired. Mm. Did that feel strange? Because obviously McKinsey, you must have spent a, a decade there, there, you know, a, a competitor, a big, fierce competitor. Oh, yeah. Well, they... They all felt strange because you're reaching out to very successful people and saying, can you spend an hour discussing my you know, midlife <laughs> crisis with me? Um, I'm thinking about getting but, a drop top car. <laughs> done that. <laughs> but, but what you realize is I think people are pretty generous if you combine it with the ability to tell their story um, and, you know, and offer advice at the same time. So I had a hundred hundred percent hit rate on all these people who I asked to meet. They all said yes. And they all spent an hour or more with me um what was, give, your, what, give, was what was your pitch sorry what the, the pitch was it was really just like here's who i am i'm scott mcdonald i run oliver wyman i i want to do something different um but i need some help thinking about what would be a useful worthwhile fulfilling thing to do and how to reach that decision you know i've seen from i've seen from your life You've made several changes, uh, and so how did you make these decisions? That's the mild ego stroke. That's a key, yes. key com component Which, of life. It's like it's like how you get people on a uh, a podcast program. You give them a bit of bit of both. <laughs> um, so I got this list of twenty people, and I, I started working my way through them. And it was one of the most the best things I've ever done. You know, I owe David enormously for forcing me to do this because mm -hmm. I didn't want to do it. No. Um, and each one was really good in terms of describing to me 
how they would thought about change, what they got wrong, they'd taken on too much afterwards, or that they should have taken a long break. Um, but also each one almost, I'd say, led to a, a job proposal. Really? Um, oh, not, wow. not quite as hard as that, but, but in still. most cases sort of, you know, and there's this thing I, I have an idea about that you should follow up or you could follow up if you want to. So, and with their own organization or people they know or? Both. Wow. And so I found that really inspiring. It kind of really energized me. And I was, I was um, very, very happy I with how it was going. I was learning a lot. And then so one of the names I, 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 I'll tell you I called. So Richard Lambert is a guy who was the editor of the FT for many years. Right, Financial Times. Yeah, yeah editor of the Financial Times. And then he left the Financial Times at about the age I wanted to leave Oliver Wyman. And he went on to run, uh, I think it's the CBI, the, the, the Business Association in the UK, ultimately ran the British Museum mm. and did many, many other things. Mm. I'm not not quite doing him justice because he's he's a really special guy and does lots of things. We should have him things. on the show. Sounds you like you could a have story. him on the show. Yeah. Um, and anyhow, on the on the call with him, he had some really good advice for me about when he'd left uh, the Financial Times, what he what he did, which was take a whole bunch of things, and what he should have done, which was go to Italy with his wife for six months and relax. Um, but at the end of that call, he flagged to me that this British council job was out there. He'd seen it, and he said, you know, I'd, I think it's a pretty hard job. It's very political, but, you know, from our conversation, it sounds like something you might be interested in, so so have a look. And so I had not known about the job. I hadn't really known that much about the British council. My my wife is a British council baby. Her parents met at a British council event oh, in, really? in, in the in the 60s in Germany, I think. What, what a coincidence. <laughs> yeah. um, That's but amazing. I didn't know much about it. And I certainly would have never noticed the job was available or thought about it. So, you know, it's just a weird sort of set of events that led to that. And then I had a look at it. I thought it was amazingly interesting and, and a really, really interesting organization. And I applied. And this is where I think luck comes into it enormously, though, because I think the British Council job would go to a more establishment figure normally. Um, they'd had a terrible um, pandemic, and you know that basically the fin the finances of the British Council were broken, um, and a fair bit of restructuring was going to be required, and so they were looking for someone. I think who was really going to roll up their sleeves and get, get into the running of the thing. How close was the British Council to going bankrupt? I, technically, they were bankrupt, I think. Wow. wow. Um, so they were... So they, yeah, the government had to support us uh, during during the pandemic with a loan, which we still have. Wow. So so when I came... You know, that's what... It, attracted me to it and but that was also the luck that enabled me to be a credible candidate I think for it as well mm -hmm. and so I went through the normal process and had to do the interviews with with um, all the various people eventually after many many months in a convoluted government process that required <laughs> approval you know right up to the top of government right up to who to, well you never know exactly how these things work but almost everyone put it that way wow um and when that comes through, um, when Rishi it, says yes, they offered me the diff different uh, boss. Then they, <laughs> <laughs> um, they offered me the job, and, and I took it. I've never, you know, I've, I've been incredibly happy since then. But everything changed. I mean, this is a different world. Um, it's a government agency. You know, lot less money, d different attitudes about most things, more bureaucracy. Um, but what we do is just wonderful, and I, I've loved it. So can you describe the strategic vision for the British Council under your leadership, and how do you prioritize the different areas that you work across? So if you think of a, sort of our core role is building trust, building trust to create peace and prosperity. So, so my job is to think about what are the best things to do to actually build trust and be most effective at that at the lowest cost for the taxpayer in mm -hmm. the UK. Um, and we, you know, we do three things. We focus on arts and culture. So we, we introduce 
UK artists across every area. So it could be music, literature, architecture, craft, um, and many, many other things to counterparts around the world um, to do things together. So they might you know, put on theater productions together. They might do music together. They might uh, do things that you know, improve the creative economy potential in a country. But through that process, they all get to know each other as well. And they get to debate you know, their different ways of life and their different values. And, and hopefully that brings us all closer together. So that's a big block of what we do. Um, and that happens everywhere. Um, and so we will have hundreds of events going on on a, you know, in a normal week. Um, we have these big cultural seasons where we link up countries. So the last couple of years, we've had a big cultural season with Ukraine, with Australia. We're doing one this year with France and one with Poland. Um, so that's a block of what we do. We do a lot of work in education where we link schools, we link universities, we help students move back and forth through scholarship programs and other things like that. And we do a lot of work in the English language where we teach English, we help systems teach English, we help countries design systems that can teach English. Mm. Um, and we do a lot of work in English assessment, which is essentially exams for people to move. So for the most part, when you move around the world to an English speaking country, you need evidence of your English capability. Yeah. Um, so we support we support that. So it's a it's a pretty wide range of stuff. And and my job has got to be, you know, just how do we how do we organize, design and deliver that in the most effective way possible. So tell us something about the British Council that we might not know that's been interesting to you. One of the things I've found interesting about the British Council is, you know, I come in as an outsider. I'm CEO of the British Council, um, but this isn't a place like Oliver Wyman that I grew up in. I knew everyone. I knew how every process works. I know all of the history. So it's more of a traditional role. So I've had to think a lot about, you know, you make this leap. What do I have to bring that's different or what do I really consciously have to focus on? And I've thought a lot about um, optimism. You know, British Council was in quite a dark place when I arrived. And you know, one of my jobs has been to be relentlessly optimistic. And you know, I often think one of the things that happens when you go from senior leader to, to CEO or, or C-suite in some way is that you have to become more optimistic. It's very fun to be kind of a senior cynic. Mm -hmm. You poke holes in everything and you don't buy what's going on. When, when you're running things, you need to be optimistic and really um, have people believe that or else the whole place will fall apart. And I think the other thing I've found there, and this may have to do with the, the fact that it's a bit of a, a government agency in a way, um, but you have to be an enormous risk taker because the systems are designed to prevent risk taking. So if you are also cautious, nothing happens. Um, and you, you really need to bring that out in a, in a place like the British Council. And I've found, you know, I've found both of those things useful and I work with my team on that a lot. Um, and that, that has been quite different than in the past. Mm, good. Okay. And obviously there's a, there's a lot of decision making that has to go on as a CEO, as a leader especially at the British Council with so many stakeholders involved. You're, dealing, you're not just dealing with people, you're dealing with countries, you're dealing with political challenges, you're dealing with so many... So you shared previously with us um, a way you approach decision-making, which I think is really helpful for people to learn and someone, something that someone taught you. Could you, could you tell us how you approach decision-making? I mean, the core of decision making for me is is focus so what am i actually spending my time on on trying to decide and when i was quite young going back to the oliver wyman days that the founder of oliver wyman said something to me which is always stuck in my head which is like the the key to being a good decision maker is splitting out decisions between the 80 percent and the 20 yep. percent and by that he meant that 80 percent of decisions are fundamentally not important um, and not, not important because they won't have an impact on someone or they might do something good or something bad. But if you get them wrong, you can reverse them. You, you can go back and just change it and, and, um, 
and fix it without an enormous cost to, to you or, or to the organization. And if you believe that, it means the best way to take decisions on those 80% is fast, to keep the organization, you know, keep metabolism high and keep everything ticking along. You don't paralyze the organization. And if you do that, it means the other 20% that are really important. And if you get wrong, it will cause you much more significant pain in some way. You, you can focus your, you know, your brain on those, get the right analysis done, get the right input on those, and take you know, the best decisions you can. Most of those 20% don't really have an answer that can be proved. Um, at least the organizations I've worked in, you know, there's tons of smart people. So if, if something has an answer, someone has already figured it out. When it comes to you, it, it tends to be something that, you know, it's going to be, you can do the analysis, you can do the thinking, but it's going to be a judgment call. But find the time to focus on those 20%, the 80% just decide on. And try and build that into the institution, get everyone thinking in the same way. So they just take fast decisions on things and then focus on the 20% and treat them with the, you know, the respect they need. Love that. Great advice. I want to touch on something. Um, you, you mentioned the importance of knowing yourself and um, quite philosophical, quite spiritual, you could say. You look at many of the world religions and you could probably see that as a common thread throughout. You have done something since, uh, I think, a young age, uh, which is meditation. When, where did that, where did you come across it? And what's your journey with meditation been? And, and, and do you still do it to this day? So, so meditation for me has been incredibly important um, because I, I think it's had a profound impact on me sort of in the long term. But also just day to day. I mean, it gives me more energy. It relaxes me. It makes me a more peaceful person. the The start of my meditation was not a very honorable one. I there was a I, I was living in Saudi Arabia at the time, and there was a um, thirteen year old American girl named uh, Jenny who I really liked, and she was going to go do a transcendental meditation course. Wow! And so I joined her to do this course yeah. to try and, and spend was... try and spend more time with her. <laughs> You um, were 13 as well? Yes, yeah, so I was 13 as well. Trying to spend more time with her, but in fact, you ended up spending more time with yourself. Yes, <laughs> indeed. <laughs> Unexpectedly. So I did a proper transcendental meditation course at that time. What which, is transcendental? So, so meditation. I'm not an expert on all the different types of meditation, but it is one, I think it is one of the older, more traditional ones. I think it comes out of India. And it's, you know, the, the method is not very complicated. You you essentially repeat a, a word over and over and you sort of drive yourself deeper um, into yourself. And once you get to that level, you really slow your your breathing and your heart rate uh, down and you're getting, you're getting like super rest at the time. But you've also opened up this space where your brain does a very odd thing, sometimes nothing, which is perhaps the most odd. Um, you know, it is just at peace, nothing's happening. But it takes, you know, you can do you can do it in 15 minutes, or you can do it in 45 minutes. And it, it takes you very, very deep, you know, so when you come out, you, you have to stretch your hands and, and, and not come out too quickly, or you can get sick. Um, How? How just do you if get you, that deep? If you, if How you, does it work? Like, if you don't meditate a lot, and you're just learning TM, you can, and you suddenly open your eyes, you know, after 15 minutes and you're too deep, the, the shock around you is just too much and you can, you can throw up. Well, the question is, how does it get you to that? How do you get to that state where that happens? It's the, it's, again, I don't really know the science of it, but repeating the word over and over again and driving it into your head. So you, you don't say the word out loud. You say it internally. Mm. Which and word, you, sorry? You're, you're never to say the word out loud. Oh. Um, so you drive it <laughs> internally more and more and more. I don't know where you're driving it deeper into your head somewhere. Can you but write that, it on a piece of paper? Um, I never have. Wow. Okay. Um, so, but I, you know, I've repeated this word for years and years and years. So, so I, so I did that regularly for years and I've had lapses where I don't meditate and I've tried all sorts of, 
new types of meditation through time. There's always various fads and ways you meditate. Essentially, they're all very similar. You're, they're, you're either focusing on your breathing, you're repeating words, you're... Um, the thing I've done a lot in the last decade is this sort of real fad for body scans. Now, maybe this has been around forever, but body scan is a similar thing, but you sort of work through, without moving your body, you work through feeling it. Like you think, okay, now I'm going to feel each toe, I'm going to feel my leg. And if you do that, normally you fall asleep, but mm. if you don't fall asleep, again, it's wonderfully relaxing. So I do a lot of that stuff. And I do everything from that to, I'm a Peloton addict, and I it's, Peloton has a nice meditation app, and you, everything from oh, five really? to thirty minutes. And you just, mm-hmm. I, so I crank a lot of those on at night. But I just find it's a wonderful way to re, to relax, to help sleep, to give you energy, and to make you more peaceful. What would you say to someone that goes, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, I've I've tried meditation, not for me. I, my mind, like I sat down for a bit, my mind's just racing. Like it's not for me. It's just." You know, I'm, I'm always, you know, got need to do something and fiddle with something. I think I'd say you, they, they've sort of proven the case for why they need to actually learn the meditation. Because um, that's, that's what it does is calm a, a mind that is moving too quickly um, and give, gives you sort of the, the space to stop all those thoughts going through. Which I think mean the rest of the thoughts that are going through can be better managed as well i see so it's it's the it's the news they don't want to hear which is based on saying that you definitely need. yeah you need to to meditate meditate even more yeah (laughs) which is that's the thing people often don't want to hear the truth or don't want to hear what they don't want to hear they want to hear that um yeah yeah, it's not for you don't worry you don't have to try because they don't have to push past that uncomfortable pain of It's hard. hard. Yeah, and I think some people do find it more difficult than others. But but in the end, it's not it's not that hard if you focus. It doesn't even take that long, and there are enough different ways of doing it that are that are worth trying. And I guess maybe some people aren't susceptible to it, but certainly I have a normally a racing mind, and I I can calm it and you know, five minutes now to, to be doing almost nothing. Mm. And that's it. It's, I think the helpful people thing, because Ashley and I have meditated for 10 years now, the helpful thing for people to know is that that moment where you realize, oh, my mind's been, oh, oh, I've been thinking about what I'm going to get for my shopping or where I'm going to go on holiday for the last five minutes. That's a great moment. Like, yeah. well done. That is, that's mindfulness. You've realized that your mind's gone off and wandered and you've come back. And so you could, and it's okay. You know, but people, that's where people then beat themselves up and say, I'm not doing it right. I'm thinking about the shopping. And that's okay. It's, it's bringing yourself back to the present that that's the actual. Yeah, and I think a consistent value. theme through all meditation is an acceptance that you can't actually force all thoughts out. Most of them are techniques of dealing with that flow of thoughts. Like how how do you slightly manage it and you know, deal with some, push them off, and and make sure you don't have a million coming in every second. Mm. I, my my actual meditation journey started with the app Headspace. Yes, <laughs> and they had this great animation of this person being by the side of a motorway and trying to like manage all the cars and they kept crashing and he'd go and man try and deal with all these cars and it was like don't you don't need to do that the, the and the, the cars are the thoughts what you need to do is step by the side of the road and just observe all the cars going along the road and if you try and stop all the cars from coming i.e the thoughts from coming that's where the car crashes come and it all becomes a mess but if you just sit back and watch the thoughts come and go everything's nice it's a good analogy how have you seen meditation has assisted you in your leadership style and dealing with potentially stressful situations or challenges when you've had to make a certain decision i think that like one of the things that is hard in leadership is that it is stressful and put whether that is you know major major people issues you're dealing with or you know big communication acts where you're delivering something that is really important to get done or the day-to-day things that blow up that that you have to deal with 
Um, and I mean, it's almost too obvious to say, but what, what you need to deal with these things is sort of patience, clarity of thought, and just an ability to work through them because they happen you know, multiple times a day. It's not like these things only happen every every six months. And so the more you know, the more your mind can be trained to to be open to that that way of approaching problems. I I think the better. I mean, I'm not claiming for a second that meditation is the answer to everything. But it's like it's like physical training. You're kind of training your brain, and and if if you're doing it regularly, you probably are calmer, more patient, mm -hmm. and that this is a you know a good thing to add to leadership. Well, I think this is a really nice topic to end things on. Something uh, you know a bit more above the 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 heavy world of business and finance and operations, etc. It's it is about knowing yourself, and it is about as you said. You can go to the gym and train your body, but training your mind is is highly valuable and can really help you succeed and perform in life. Um, so that was the story of how you became CEO of the British Council. And we come to the end of this um, episode now with another poem. Um, Wonderful. Before we get to the poem, um, yeah, I will share something I think people can learn from your story um, is that if you're going through a tough time especially if it's you're going through a tough time in your career maybe the job is not fulfilling you or maybe you have been laid off or think you might be um, maybe you're applying for roles and getting a lot of rejection your story is one that shows that it's not all doom and gloom it doesn't end there. That state you're in now is not going to last forever. If you really can take that ability to look within yourself and go, is there anything I can do to change, to help change this scenario? Or what do I want to go and, and do? Because at every moment in your life, whether you were at the start of your career getting rejected or whether you were um, later in your career and not knowing what to do, you both times you eventually did something about it and you changed the way you operated you made those phone calls to those people and that led to the answer and i think yours is a great story that you shouldn't give up hope um but you should speak to people and ask for advice and then take action on that and that's what can can help you progress and just remember it's a very long game many things happen um, absolutely and and yeah some of them will um, some of them will be bad and and unavoidable. Hundred percent, yeah. And it is your it's your um, it's your attitude in those moments that make the big difference. If you go, man, this is so bad. This is terrible. Oh, why is life like this? It's going to make the situation worse. If you can get the training in your mind and the practice for in those moments to just see the funny side of it laugh about it joke about it realize this is not going to last forever it can really help through those moments and probably you do need to make sure you don't expect the superhuman too because when you have big downs in your career you know you're not going to laugh immediately you're not going to bounce back the next day mm. um so you don't need to beat yourself up so much for if you want to be depressed for a few days or a week or even longer, that's probably fine as well. And you should let the process work itself out. But you do have to bounce back at one point. And yes. That's probably the thing to focus on. It's amazing how good it feels to go, okay, I'm feeling sad right now. And just accept it, accept the emotion. And in a, in a funny way, and then you feel a bit better and you feel a bit happier. When you like honor that feeling and emotion, it really helps. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And now for your closing poem. Seeing different departments showed a young Scott where he wanted to take his first step. Mergers and acquisitions, but his perceived lack of ambition meant that he had to take a new job trek. Sometimes where you're at doesn't mean that's where you should always be. And a painful moment in life can show you the right reflections you needed to see. Throwing your name in the hat could be the path, in fact, to an unexpected journey, leading you to step up and believe in your ability, 
while at the same time being confident from early. If I've learned a few things today, then one thing I will say is that you grow quicker with time for self-observation. Leadership can be stressful, but you can be successful through practices such as quiet meditation. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today. My pleasure. Thank you. And that is how you became CEO of the British Council. Wonderful.